host and moderator this evening. If we get CMSME and BDA knowledge sharing webinars are now gearing momentum. We are now prepared with our second session, which is a very interesting topic. Rather than the very backbone of any organization, be it domestic or international. Our members today are sure to get fruitful insights and tips about international marketing and branding from the trade gurus themselves. I'd like to begin the webinar today by inviting Mr. Kim Se, Director of Piki and Treasurer of Piki CMSME. Mr. Hemi Seth has been associated with Piki for more than two decades. He heads the MSME division at Piki and is also responsible for activities of Piki CMSME, which is an allied body of Piki, created to serve the MSME sector of the country since 2013. He has been instrumental in organizing various capacity building programs for MSMEs across the country and has also led various MSME delegations to other countries. His knowledge and expertise in MSME sectors is commendable. I welcome Mr. Hemi Seth today to say a few words to you. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, thank you for introducing me. Uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Amandal, founder of Comms Credible. Mr. Anuj Khanna, executive director, Sava International. Mr. Dave Mediros, uh, director and marketing head, USA. Uh, I think he's yet to join, uh, but I'm sure we'll be having him soon. Uh, Ms. Archil Kansal, General Secretary, Bank Agent Association, uh, MSMEs, friends and colleagues. Uh, at the outset, I would like to, uh, on behalf of PIKI CMSME, uh, sincerely acknowledge the presence of all dignitaries and the entrepreneurs who have joined us through virtual mode uh, and are keen to explore business opportunities uh, for getting into the export market. Uh, the MSME sector has always been the priority of PIKI and in 2013, uh, PIKI established a dedicated allied body uh, FIKI Confederation of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises with a mission of empowering MSMEs. We at FIKI CMSME, the MSME arm of FIKI, firmly believe that MSMEs have immense potential which is yet to be exploited and export is an area which could be a mine of opportunities for MSMEs. Exports not only does increase the volume and profitability of the business, but it also enables MSMEs to improve upon the quality, standards, technology, etc., which in turn enhances the image of MSME in global business arena. However, it is true that lack of awareness and knowledge creates roadblocks for MSMEs to tap overseas markets. Those who have already ventured into these waters are struggling with other issues such as compliance, quality, standards, product dimensions, etc. Uh, FIKI CMSME has realized that there is an immense gap of information in the export ecosystem which needs to be bridged. And with this objective, we join hands with Buying Agent Association to serve the MSME of the country who are aspiring to grow big through exports. I am thankful to BA for joining hands with us and extending their expertise for benefit of MSMEs. I'm happy that today we are organizing the second session of the series. Those who missed the first session Last session was focused upon highlighting the role and the need of design and development and aimed at making participants understand the importance of international design. Today's sessions will highlight the need to prep up a product from the domestic market and brand it to make it market and occasion specific internationally. This shall enable the audience to understand that the product packaged and marketed for one occasion should be different from the other occasion. I'm thankful to Mr. Amandhal and Mr. Anuj Khanna who have joined today and will also share insight on different ways of marketing of our exports through the medium of fair exhibitions, etc. I especially express gratitude to Mr. Dave Mediros, who will join soon, uh, I'm sure, and has joined us from USA uh, despite being very early hours in the US. So, uh, you know, uh, he will be uh, you know speaking at this early hour for, with us and taking our time and thank you so much mr Day, for that he will elaborate on the marketing trends and possibilities based on consumer behavior trends and forecasts and occasion in the usa thereby highlighting the business opportunities for the manufacturers i'm sure this session will benefit many msmes and help them in their endeavors for entering into export markets and achieve their desired goals Without taking much of time, I would like to conclude. And before I do so, once again, I would like to welcome you all at this session. Over to you, Tanya. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Heyman. We are hopeful that all your CMSE members will have something to take back from the 
especially today in knowledge sharing webinar. I now like to welcome Ms. Anjal Kansi, General Secretary of the AA. Anjal is heading in source international for over 10 years and has been the young diamond general secretary of the Wine Agents Association for over three years. She has been the front face of the AA and has been extensively involved in getting the new recognition in the service, service export sector and the international trade with all agencies and government bodies, hence bringing value to the trade. Archul has been a process-oriented person and has made much progress in both the source and the AA using the process of I invite Anjul to share her thoughts today with the panel. Thank you so much, Tanya, and thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody today, our participants who've taken out time to be with us and participate and understand the real importance of marketing and branding in today's day and age. I would particularly thank Piki C MSME because this endeavor is indeed very, very important for the manufacturing sector today. And as Hemant very rightly said, for the MSMEs of today. And with partnering, we have brought around a beautiful amalgamation of manufacturing and exports and trying to further the cause that BA is very, very deep about, that is about knowledge dissemination and providing knowledge to our local manufacturers to be able to give that product, that quality to the world that really the world is looking for out of India. So um, I would say it's an absolute great initiative done by Fiki here. And thanks to Heman, thanks to Jyoti Vij, who has been constantly pushing this course forward and taking things ahead. I would like to thank Aman and Anuj in specific today. Both of them are masters in the field on, manu on manufacturing as well as marketing. Anuj comes from a very long background of manufacturing and understands the importance of marketing in today's data and age when it comes to our local manufacturers going abroad. India has, I would say, particularly lagged in the capability of branding and marketing ourselves. And we have generally marketed our products as other people's products. So somewhere today is the time when we need to market ourselves the way we are. You know, we need to own our product and say this is ours. So today the entire webinar is routed at understanding the importance of marketing, of branding, of the need why it is important to own our product rather than just let everybody take it. I'm not saying that we can't let other people's brand it because that's all exports is about. But creating that signature on a product or a design is what we need to do. Creating that uniqueness, creating your brand is the most important thing, especially in today's day and age where people are going all online, when the entire world is frankly operating online. So it is only brands and marketing techniques that are doing well, that are visible, that are able to project themselves in the right way, are the companies that are actually moving forward. Aman, with his very, very wide and rich experience in marketing, will definitely take you through some very deep perspectives. And I also am very thankful to Dave, who will be joining in for sharing his views on what the buyers are expecting out of India and what they do at their own end. Having said this, I would not take too much of time and I would let Tanya take the session forward and introduce our speakers and take it ahead. Thank you so much, Tanya. Thanks, Anjo. Thank you so much. It's time now to invite our esteemed speaker. Mr. Aman Dhal, founder of Comms Credible, is a multi-talent by himself, an Indian communications specialist, widely known for his role in building the InsurTech brand and PolicyBazaar.com. The brand became a unicorn in 2018 and has been one of India's most successful financial startups to emerge since 2008. In 2020, he started the integrated communications firm, Comms Credible, focused on media relations, crisis management, and brand building through content leadership. In 2019, Exchange for Media recognized Aman among India's first, a most influential game changer in corporate communications and PRP. He has been also identified as India's best young talent for the field of marketing, advertising, public relations in various 40 under 40 lists by media houses. Members, he carries over 15 years of experience in media, financial services, consumer internet and development sector, 
and has worked in editorial marketing communications and advocacy roles with influential brands such as the Times, Times of India Group, UNICEF, CEDA, and Magic Bus India Foundation. Let's welcome Mr. Aman to share his presentation and give us insights into the world of international marketing and branding. Hi everyone. Uh, first things first, I want to check. Uh, I hope there is no background noise. Uh, I'm trying to figure out a place, but I can say I was actually somewhere else, and I got stuck, and I couldn't move. So, am I audible? Uh, are you able to listen to me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, okay. Uh, I need to share my presentation, which. I'm not able to see. If anyone can share it, that would be brilliant. That would be very, very helpful, actually. Uh, you're not able to share. Uh, there's some background noise happening from uh, the side. Yeah. Or maybe let me uh, let me do one thing. Let me figure out the IT system. In the meanwhile, maybe Anush can start before me, and uh, in the meanwhile, I can figure out. On the background and uh, the stuff. Sure, that, that's Is a that good idea, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you Great. move forward with Anuj for now? Okay, thank you. Due to some voice congestion, we will move on with the uh, uh, next speaker. And has been a business traveler for 48 countries and worked with 419 international companies, including Fortune 50 companies. He has been the published author of the first book of home textile industry called The Biggest Problem of Buying Home Textiles from India and Seven Simple Steps to Fix It. He's been a trainer and coach for Uzbekistan manufacturers. He's participated in more than 97 international trade fairs across five continents. Let's welcome Mr. Anuj to share his presentation. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. And first of all, thanks uh, to the Buying Agents Association, uh, Anchal, and also the FIKI to giving me the opportunity to share uh, the knowledge uh, that has been gained uh, by 40 years, four decades, uh, with my father leading the majority of the years and me as the second generation being a manufacturer exporter of home furnishing textiles taking it forward uh, from since 2002 when i first joined the company so whatever we have learned in our 40 years of our successes of our failures i've tried to condense it down and as what uh, archul said very uh, rightfully that this is the time that it's all about marketing and branding Indian products are extremely good standard products. Haven't been the good products, people around the world would not have been buying our products. But where we are completely lacking or like lacking majorly is marketing and branding and how do we present that beautiful products that is created by our artisans, by our handicrafts people across all product standards which are being right now exported from India. So what I've, uh, I'll start sharing my presentation. And I hope it's uh, visible now to everyone. Yes, it's visible. Uh, great. So what I'm trying to do is keeping my uh, presentation short and sweet to the point of international marketing and how do we make our presence felt. And I have uh, not covered a specific uh, product, but I've tried to cover all the different products from handicrafts to jewelry. So the science and the logic and my learnings behind uh, is covered in all these areas and um, i'll not take much time in introduction in introducing myself as um, i've been already introduced but yes i was this is one of the books that the first books that i have published was on home textile industry and um, have been receiving good sales from the us customers also because of the gap of how we produce in india and how the goods are being uh, you know thought about the indian manufacturers so coming to the topic of international marketing, I think there uh, first, of course, is the market. 
here we are keeping our focus to the American market. So I've covered my presentation, keeping the market focus as USA. Then comes the message. And the message by when I say message is what are we really selling? Uh, so when you go to a haircut, you know, you do, you get a haircut, but that's not the product. What you come out is a style. Similarly, when the, pro when the product, uh, the consumers are producing and we are exporting it, what is the message that we are trying to tell in international marketing to our customers in the US? What is that that we are really creating? And the third most important part in international marketing is the media. And by media is what kind of media and what kind of medium we are choosing to communicate our message to the market that we are trying to cater. So when we are covering the market, that's the US market. So I'll briefly touch upon different areas of uh, the from stereotypes and what is your clarity on market because focus becomes the key point here. Second is the message of how you have to communicate your message about your company, your product, your benefit. What's the service that you are actually offering? Are you just offering, for example, a jewelry or a handicraft piece? Or are you actually offering more than that? And that gets covered uh, in that part. So we'll begin with the market, um, understanding your target market. Um, this is one area, the most important area, which I would recommend all the fellow exporters from India to really understand the American market and cater that market into two different categories. One is the primary market. Primary market, when I say, is the market that the current buyers in the US are buying your products, whether it is home textiles, whether it is hard goods, whether it is jewelry, who are the kind of customers who are currently buying? Those are the customers who are aware of that particular product and the benefits associated from that product. So defining that primary market for your company, for your product, Second is the secondary market. The reason I have focused on the secondary is because when we make, when we'll come to the message part, we always create a message for a particular customer, the target primary customer. But when we cater to that, there would be other kind of customers who would also be interested in tagging along. But we have to keep as manufacturers and exporters from India, our laser focus on our primary US market and the customers who are your particular product or your services who are those customers over there who are those companies we will go it in a mid bone detail in the next slide but your best market will be those who have purchased that product or services similar to yours before so while you are identifying your primary us market and when i say market i would mean the customer so who are those customers who are buying those similar product or services which is similar to your product and services now, when I say similar, the word similar also identifies the cross sell and the upsell. So, for example, in home textile, I would say an upsell would be something like I am able to supply more than that or a cross sell. Cross sell would be things like carpets that goes along with the other products in your home textile. Upsell would be to sell something like fillers and other uh, products which go along with the home textile product. So when you are doing your research and targeting and focusing your targets on your primary US market, that is one way that you have to understand that which is the market that you'll be going after, which are those customers, which are your dream customers, which are your idle customers. And those customers, you have to be very focused on identifying that this is the market, this is the customer that I need to uh, build my uh, message and media along. So coming on to identify your US customers, what do you do? You first basic thing is to start with demographics because US is a big, big country and the taste, uh, the requirements, the systems vary quite a lot between the East Coast to the West Coast. So there is a many uh, differences between the kind of geographies that they are located, the sizes of the, uh, the location. And when I say sizes, it also refers to the size of the company, whether it's a big box retailer or whether it's an importer, if they are retailers, so where all do they have their shops? What all are their consumers? Who are the end consumers? Now, if you are supplying a product to a retailer, then who are those retailers end consumer? Is it the middle age from 20s to 40s? Is it the 40s to 60s? Or is it females or is it males? So what is that product and who is your end consumer, your end consumer of the customer that you are supplying to? 
Next is, of course, physiographics that how your people, the buyers who are making the decision, how are they making the decision? Because marketing is all about making life easy for your customer. So you create your message, you uh, articulate your message in a way that makes the life easier for a customer. Now, how do you make a life easier is simple. First, you solve a problem. Every time and any time you're able to solve a problem, whether it's a problem of product development, whether it's a problem of how I'm going to match it with the other products that I'm buying. So you have to identify your pain problems of the customer that they are buying. People only shed money or people only give money when you're able to identify the pain problems that they are having. It could be compliances, it could be certification, it could be prices, it could be inconsistent quality. You have to identify those kind of things because those are the challenges of a, of a customer, of a buyer who is coming to buy from India. Those are the problems that we as Indians have to think for them before we start thinking about marketing our product and services. And if you can't define them, you will never be able to find it. That's what I say that if you do not know who are your target customers, it will be very difficult for you to find them. So identifying your target customer is very, very important. And going after those targeted customer and not try and sell your product to everybody and anybody is would not be a very fruitful strategy in a long term because you'll be burning cash, you'll be burning resources, you'll be wasting your time. And it would be like a hit and trial message. So first thing is to identify who is actually your customer. What is, uh, I'll be coming more in detail on, the, on this later as well. And another key point I would mention here is you want to be a big fish in a small pond. So your big fish in a small pond is better than a small fish in a big pond. So try and create your product or a services which is good or unique to a certain niche or to a certain specific customer. It could be one, it could be two. The beauty of the American market is that the consumption is phenomenally high. And that's where the exporters, the manufacturers love to work with America is because of the consumption in comparison to any other country right now in the world, whether it's Europe taken as a total, the consumption, uh, the buying power, the purchase cycles of the American consumers is phenomenally high, which makes it very attractive. Having said that, you need to focus what is that particular niche of the customers that you'll be working and whatever product and services you have from your handicraft, from your jewelry, from your carpets, try and be a big fish in a small pond, rather trying to compete with everybody who's a much, um, you know, who's a small fish in a big pond. Now, this is some of the stereotypes uh, that I have experienced from the American customers that I would like to highlight to my fellow exporters and other MSMEs from India, that the Americans are a bit informal when it comes to uh, comparison with the European customers. So try and create your language, your communication, your uh, marketing uh, languages, your emails to be a bit more informal rather than being formal in comparison to the European markets. They are more direct and they are much, much more open. So beating around the bush online, uh, writing, for example, long emails is not would not be the best of the choices when you're communicating with the American customers. Be direct, be open about it and come to the point as quickly as possible. Competition and free enterprise is the spirit of the American people at large. Uh, they believe in competition, which is a good sign, and they believe in free enterprise. So it's like an equality and a liberty to produce and to offer your products is something that is very well welcomed in the American customers. Practicality and efficiency. Efficiency by default has is a mandate now around the world. So and they much, but I have found the American customers much more for future oriented, much more vision oriented at large. That what are we thinking about 2021? What are we thinking about 2022? For example, in my world, we have already almost at the verge of finishing our spring summers 2022. So we have to think they're much more uh, long sighted when it comes to thinking and because their capacities, their quantities are at large is pretty good. So they want to make sure that they are planning it in advance. So these are the some of the stereotypes I wanted to share. So who are your real customers for your products? 
uh, whether it's big box retailers by big box retailers of course i mean companies like walmart uh, companies like uh, kmart companies which are big big uh, have many many retailers those are big box retailers are they mail order houses they are of course much more mail order houses that i have come across from my experience in europe than in us but again this business especially because of the covid and corona is on a rise so all the business in mail order because people are getting the catalogs at home they are ordering it from home the products are being delivered home to the consumer this business has again started increasing and has seen a quite a bit of increase in the european market in 2020 so identify are there importers will they buy from you and distribute it to other retailers are they wholesalers Will they buy like 400, 500 pieces, depending upon your product and sell it 10, 20, 30 pieces to small retailers? Or are they small retailers that you would like to go after? Or it's an e-commerce company that you would go after. Amazon US is another a big uh, way of coming and connecting the Indian consumers to the American direct, the Indian exporters directly to the, uh, to the consumers in the US. So who are the real buyers for you? You need to define for your company, for your product, which one is the one that you would really would like to go after? And you think more than what you think is how well you can solve the problem for them. What is that pain problem? What is the solution? What are the challenges that you can solve for these kind of customers? You would have to identify those for them. Coming on to the message, uh, it's a very common when we are making a message and by the message, I mean everything that you are communicating with your customers right from your company's name to the email to your domain to your website, everything that every time you're communicating, the key questions in the buyer's mind is simple. Why should I buy it if it is your product or service? First thing, even once we buy anything, we first understand why we buy it. You know, why do we need, for example, if we need an iPhone, why do we need an iPhone? It could be a status symbol, it could be a convenience symbol, it could be any reason. Similarly, even in B2B buy, and this is very clear in the American buyers, why should I buy it if they have a budget, if they have a corner to be displayed, if they have a season, if they have a sales revenue task, that question is there in the buyer's mind. And if one, that is solved, why should I buy it from you? Now, the answers to these two questions have to be prepared and you have to be able to understand what is the answer to these two questions if you were a buyer. If you were an American buyer buying your product or services, for example, in America, what are the answers to this? Because your message and everything that you communicate has to consciously, subconsciously, directly and indirectly highlight this area because this is the root question that comes in the buyer's mind why should i buy it and why should i buy it from you so the message of who you are what you do and why your target market should buy from you must be direct definite and very sharp so whether i'll be coming to the usp as well so who you are what you do so I'm a manufacturer of X, Y, Z. I help customers achieve A, B, C so that they are not able to attain. So this, whatever your introduction message is, whether your tagline is, whether your presentation is going, what is that message that you are communicating in all the exchanges to your customer? In that, the message, of course, your USP, your primary distinguishing factor. The reason I have highlighted primary is because that's the number one reason that distinguishes you from the other people who are selling the similar product and services. And your USP, I have most of some of the USP I've noticed is always company oriented, but it has to be a customer oriented USP. It has to be of a benefit to the tar target customer. It is not the benefit to the company that you are producing or the company that you own or the product that you have, but your USB has to reflect the customer orientation, the benefit to your target uh, customer. To create the best USB, what is most important is to know what you are most important is to understand your target market. What's most important to them? whether it is design, whether it is price, whether it is delivery, whether it is product development, whether it is compliances, what is one, the most important thing for your customer needs to be understand. What are the challenges that they face in buying from India, your particular product? What is the most important thing that you are able to solve for them? 
specifically for you whenever you are communicating once you have the usb put it up front and center by including it in your business name you know it could be a part of your business name it could be a part of your tagline if you have a tagline it comes very clear of what your company are and what do you do because this i have learned also when because we have expanded quite a business in us we got the sales office done in or everything was done during the covid time and a little bit everything started earlier but the reason we were able to do because i was able to implement the same strategies of communicating very clear the product and the taglines that we are having and if you even have an existing usp i would say try and rethink and create another more powerful one that is very clear that is very direct that is very uh, discreet and to the point to the customers in the us so you have to think in your product what is the buyers want do they want the highest quality do they want the lowest price do they want the fastest service do they need the customized service do they need a personal service so most of the usps that you create would be superlatives they would you know end with est like fastest delivery or you know you have to come up with your usp while you are creating your usp and try and use an um a superlative ending with it largest selection for example uh fastest delivery uh closest or open longest hottest so all these become the words that can be used and should be used to communicate your usp to the american customers your name must convey your message and it has to be attractive so whatever name you come up if you are if you are there for four generation three generation 200 uh, 20 years 30 years highlight because being one of the oldest is again one of the strong points which highlights credibility when the customer is looking at your company so then comes the media so i've covered the market i've covered the message now if you have a message which is just crispy clear what's the media What, how are you going to reach out to the us customers again there are three important thing when it comes to targeting in the us market one is the content one is the delivery and one is the amplification now content i mean what is the whether it's an infographic whether it's a ad whether it's a presentation whether it's an emailer whether it is a photo shoot that you are doing so how are you creating that content and the the best thing is to follow the best of the people in your trade your industry so pick up the top notch companies who are in your product are selling to the consumers and on the highest try and see what they are doing how they are doing it learn from the best they have done it for the years that's why they are on the top of the chart try and create your content on the same spirit i am not saying you have to copy them never ever do that because try and being original is the first and the most trustworthy thing which comes which i am going to cover later as well second is the delivery how are you going to communicate this message are you communicating it through email are you communicating it through infographics are you communicating it in through your presentations how are you delivering your message once you have delivered in marketing in especially in international marketing having sent one delivery doesn't mean the end of it you have to amplify that message so if one customer likes it there would be 100 more like that there would be 20 more like that who would also like it then you need to amplify the message that you were sending it out you have to repeat it you have to set up a schedule that how i'm going to amplify it which all platforms i can amplify the same message that i have been doing so first is to currently understand where your business currently is do you have a website uh, digital marketing i am uh, i'm very very pro digital marketing because that is the way forward and for the people who say that digital marketing doesn't work in b2b i would say they are completely wrong because b2b or b2c digital marketing is the way forward um in despite the most difficult situations of covid 2020 i think everybody around the world has uh, lived up to a level where they understand that the life can go on digitally as well when it comes to commerce and business uh not personal relationship i wouldn't say that but definitely when it comes to commerce and business life can go on life will go on because why it is more efficient it is more effective it is more focused not only for the manufacturer but also for the buyers it gives them clarity of course we need samples to hand feel it to see it to see the qualities that is a part of it 
but traveling internationally to get and market your products would definitely is not the only way forward. There would be things that, so you have to take it into account. What is your online activity right now? What do you have a website? If there is a website, how well it is made? Do you have a Facebook page? Do you have a YouTube channel or a blog, Twitter handle, LinkedIn, Instagram? So you have to understand where your customers are. So depending upon the products and services that you're offering, who is your target customer? I'm not saying you have to do them all. Definitely a big no to that. But you have to choose which one is the right medium for you. Which one is the way forward? For example, I shared an example. Like for the European customers, the WhatsApp communication is much less. With the US customer, it's very quick. So you have to choose which one would you be choosing as your online activity status. Whether it is your website becomes the most important thing right now. I mean, in India, a lot of MSMEs have beautiful, awesome websites being done. Some are in the middle part, some are still trying to create. I would highly recommend working on your website. And uh, you have to work on yourself as a business owner, as a marketing person to understand about marketing. Learn from online uh, classes. There are so many people who are teaching about international marketing. You have to invest yourself and understand and choose the right business uh, platform of delivering from my experience what has worked for sawa i would say linkedin is number one because all the professional networks and the business networks for b2b marketing for b2b understanding of the customers linkedin is the number one platform where i would recommend email marketing of course there are many uh, platforms that you can use for email marketing uh, MailChimp is one of the best that i i would recommend because it's number one it's free and it can help you if you are a beginner or an intermediate stage to lead, reach to a certain level and you can do a lot of automations into that so email marketing really works because the same message and content what you have created you can deliver it and you can amplify it but make sure you're delivering it to your targeted audiences as i mentioned earlier in my presentation and you're not just uh, piling up uh, email addresses and not just buying data, which is, you know, alphantal data, because it will not help you. It will take your cost, it will take your money, it will take your energy. And at the end, it will give you frustration that I'm not getting any results from it. So don't go for quantity of emails, go for quality of emails. And by quality, I mean you doing your homework first, identifying who your target customer. So you don't have to send tens and thousands of emails, send it to hundreds, but those hundreds should be your targeted customers. Um, and third is your website. So you have a website which clearly communicates like a, what I said, what's your message? What does your company do? How do you help us? What are your USPs? What is your strength? This should be clearly communicated. So these three platforms I would recommend as uh, from my experience as the most fruitful platforms to have international customers and to make your presence felt for the US customers to be used. Um, in the end, I'll quickly cover the five tips for international marketing. First is to create and revise your marketing strategy. Uh, I have noticed because I work with Uzbekistan uh, manufacturers as well, I help them get their products across the globe. Um, and Uzbekistan is a country which like India was earlier in 90s when it comes to export because they're a heavy uh, dominant uh, company and is first to first make a very clear marketing strategy. Uh, I want to sell to America. I would like more customers from America. I want to sell to so many. It's a very good statement and a very good aim or a goal to achieve. But what is your plan to achieve it? This is where your marketing strategy, commitment of your resources, commitment of most importantly, your time, your energy in spending and different set of strategies come, uh, comes into play. So create and make your marketing strategy for the US market. Create an excellent first impression. If you So whenever you are ready, you have to make a very good first impression because you will not get a second chance impression. You know, uh, when you communicate your first email, when you have your first talk, the first eight seconds on a research base says that we are the, the tempo is set or an analysis is made whether I'm in or not. So rest of the time, in your first impression is all about analyzing whether that the decision made is right or wrong. But the decision by research analysis states that in the first eight seconds of your meeting, of your communication, it is going to be set 
how it is going to go. So make sure you have a very good uh, first impression. Invest in relevant content. Be prepared to connect with them on their terms. Use different preferred digital. So whatever content, you don't have to send long and long and lengthy things. Whatever content, be, be it less. I would say less, 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 and less is more. I still face challenges within my company sometimes with people when I'm with my marketing team to communicate less and clear and to the point. It's not about quantity. It is about how clear you are. And clarity comes by self-questioning it. So always ask more and tell less in sales, in marketing, always ask more so you're clear. And when you're clear, you are able to reply shortly. The reason we start telling longer, longer, longer things is because we are not clear what we want. If we are clear, that can be shortened down. Ensure your messaging and ideas translate uh, accurately. As I said, be direct, clear, crisp, and to the point. Your marketing favorites needs to be both. Yeah, getting into the US market, it's very important that you have a scalable uh, marketing strategy because uh, US is not a country like Europe where you can have, you know, the same resources looking after different things because that's the thing. That's the reason I mentioned it's like adding rooms onto a house every time a new family member instead of working from a master plan what happens is <clears throat> when we have a new account into the company what happens the same merchant or the same back office support is given to that okay you look it is not that when you enter into us you have to make room for that particular company because they are serious they are big usually they have the quantity so you have to create that room you have to commit those resources you have to commit and add on that room within your organization so that you are able to cater to those customers otherwise it not it will not be sustainable you will have a one shot you will have seven shot you might not have a third order because you lose it out you will not be able to sustain what you got in and scalable is if you're able to do that you're able to replicate and repeat it with the other people other companies similar companies who are out there as well so these are the five tips I wanted to share in my presentation covering the US market. And if there is any other questions, I would be happy to take that. Thank you so much, Anur. Thank you so much. That was really well valuable tips for I think almost all of us here. Uh, we'll take the question and answers later. We have our speakers uh, waiting in line. So we move on to Mr. Aman Hal. Yeah. He's already been introduced before, but I'll quickly introduce him again. Mr. Amal Nal, founder of Coms Credible, is a multi talent by himself, an Indian communication specialist, widely known for his role in building the InsureTech brand and PolicyBazaar.com. The brand became a unicorn in 2018 and has been one of India's most successful financial startups to emerge since 2008. Mr. Amandal, I would like to share your presentation. Uh, thank you so very much, Tanya. Uh, just a sec, I'm just trying to figure out. Okay, I'm here. Is the presentation visible? Yes, it's visible. Brilliant. Okay, brilliant. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the association, Buying Agent Association, uh, Tanya, uh, Archil, uh, Picky, uh, you know, for inviting me here. And uh, I had a fantastic experience, I think, last time as well. Uh, when you people did something in uh, Habitat uh, for the great experience interacting with the community. Uh, secondly, I think uh, I must really, really commend Anuj. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, you know, the fact that you actually took everyone through the basics uh, that one needs to think of when they're thinking of marketing, especially focused on the USA market. That was one brilliant presentation. You know, you actually really uh, broke down the tips in a very, very effective, simple and concise way. And again, you know, I'm also a very, very firm believer in the fact that do less, you know, with doing less, you can do far more rather than try to do everything. Uh, and you need to be very, very 
pertinent with your points, uh, especially you know when you are thinking of marketing. And again, you know, I think just to add to Anuj, you know, uh, you know, if if you are not good at marketing, uh, hire a specialist. Uh, a lot of times we think we can do everything, uh, you know, groom a resource or hire an excellent agency somewhere, which I feel because I also come from a town Muradabad where, you know, the whole community is very, very export oriented, focused. And I feel again, uh, they can do far more with their marketing activities. Anyways, you know, coming to uh, my bits, I'm going to just add to, you know, what whatever Anuj presented. And I feel, you know, in terms of the piece which we talk about marketing, International marketing has, you know, far more peace and, you know, uh, generally, you know, when you will think of marketing and I feel, you know, it's, it's slightly more complex when you think of exports, especially in terms of, you know, you're thinking of, uh, you know, your the transactions as well. You are thinking of, uh, you know, your, does your staff have the necessary skills? And I was talking about the same, you know, you have the skills, you know, you know, what your business stands for, what's your business purpose. But does your staff also have that enough skills uh, to communicate the same, you know, when you are dealing with the client? And that is far more important. Do you have that second chain in command who can deal uh, in terms of, you know, communicating to the clients? And then again, like, you know, be it planning, you know, be it paperwork, be it practices, be it partnerships, be it policies or be it positioning or be it protection, adequate protection. You know, all these things somewhere, you know, are very, very important when we are thinking of international marketing. And I don't want to delve deeper into these because uh, somewhere a lot of these things were covered by Anuj. But at the same time, this is something which every veteran can think through when they are when they are creating their marketing plan. And I'm going to much more focus on, you know, especially, you know, prices and, uh, you know, where should you spend your money? Uh, and everyone faces a crisis in their business. At times, it could be a crisis which is on an economy, which is pulling down sectors, or it could be, you know, a very, very sector focused crisis. So how should you deal with marketing during such times? And these are again, like the points which I'm going to talk about our focus in terms of, you know, my interaction with a lot of these people uh, who did well uh, during these times. And these were the common things which came through in terms of how they were able to overcome uh, the challenges of a pandemic or, or a crisis. You know, we had a crisis in 2000 as well, in the year 2008. Every eight, 10 years, market will throw a crisis. Whenever the economy will peak, there'll be a correction. And somewhere, you know, what becomes very, very important is how you are highlighting your brand purpose uh, when you are uh, dealing with a crisis. Uh, when I say brand purpose, you know, see, eventually, uh, the business will have some difficulties in terms of during a crisis, you know, your contracts might be, uh, you know, become very, very com competitive. They might be cut down. Uh, there might be no business as well. But does that mean, uh, you know, your communication should uh, become lesser? Not at all. You know, these are the times when you need to highlight your brand values in a far more consistent, regular way even more than, you know, what you would do usually. And here, you know, things like a newsletter, uh, you know, WhatsApp, you know, if, if your customer in the US, again, like Anuj pointed out very well that, you know, in the US, people are far more uh, comfortable with a, with a platform like WhatsApp, unlike Europe. So you need to know, you know, whatever channel they are comfortable with. But what is important is uh, through different means, through different ways of content, it could be, images, uh, you know, it could be infographics, it could be stories, uh, but how you are highlighting your brand purpose all the time. Uh, you know, uh, engagement is very, very important, out of sight, out of mind. And uh, a lot of times uh, when such situations happen, uh, we, we forget that, you know, uh, rather than looking to address them internally, uh, we, we tend to the lesser focus on that regular flow of communication and that regular flow of communication doesn't mean you need to pick up the phone and tell you know what is happening but it means you know through different channels be it linkedin be it your own website where you are pushing out content and i feel content has a very very big role to play be it during the brand building be it during a crisis because it it really really 
tells your brand purpose, uh, especially when tough times come in. Again, like also within that content, you need to share a lot of research and insights. Uh, you know, what is happening with your workers here? You know, there are policies which have come in. So you need to talk about the challenges on the ground. Uh, the fact that uh, you need to uh, have the newer, basically, you know, there are newer uh, workplace measures which are in place for uh, workers. So basically, you know, you need to communicate the same that there could be delays. You know, you are trying to do your bit. And these again could be pictorial, you know. If you have created those changes and your workplace has started to come back again, you need to highlight again through pictures and newsletters, those things, you know. And again, again, LinkedIn is a great platform. And I and I really feel that, you know, uh, businesses, especially uh, unlike a lot of other platforms where there is a lot of different kind of communication happening, uh, LinkedIn is a very, very focused business networking platform. And people expect case studies to be there. People expect people to share their industry insights. And again, uh, you know, just writing articles, you know, PR, uh, you know, uh, you sharing your media bytes, uh, that again, you know, it, it, it really, really helps. But again, they should be factual. They need to have enough facts around it. They just cannot be uh, half baked. Uh, similarly, again, like, how much agile you are during these times, how much consistency is in there in your brand communication. A lot of times, uh, you, know, you don't need to actually change the wheel. Uh, you might have to reinvent the brand communication, but that, that doesn't mean that your brand purpose changes. The way you communicate, that would change. And that is very, very important that you go back to your brand purpose, the why you started this business. Those ethos, are you able to clearly communicate and are your workers, are your employees able to communicate? A lot of times, a lot of times, you know, uh, just the fact that, you know, when, how you deal with your own employees, you know, how you can actually create that messaging in their minds, how, can, how they are communicating to their family or beyond, that can become a very, very strong word of mouth. And similarly, again, like uh, during such times, content becomes very, very important. Invest in it. A lot of, Again, like people tend to overlook the importance of content. Uh, I feel, you know, be it crisis or no crisis, content development is very, very important. Uh, you need to have a lot of stories to tell. There could be one big story, which is your brand purpose, but there could be multiple stories. Uh, you could have a focus around one story where you are trying to focus in terms of your product line in terms of uh, how do you see that particular year moving for you in terms of what you see as your focus of a business area uh, but you need to have very very different stories which are all aligning to your larger purpose and again like you know sharing constantly business inputs uh, in terms of what is happening on the su supply chain side uh, you need to communicate all this through different means and again you can choose your channels uh, you you know best what your marketing channels are and I think the founders know it best nobody else will know a marketeer will be able to efficiently effectively deliver the content on those channels but that those channels you would always know where your customer is and if you don't know you have no means to be in the business so uh, it's very very important to communicate in different ways the challenges that you are going through and again your tonality is very very important during these times you know how you are actually trying to give inputs even if you have lost business from a certain client are you effectively you know even then delivering them inputs, or how can you actually uh, improve uh, see everyone is going through different set of challenges and these times means that you know you have to communicate in terms of your business inputs uh, irrespective of that business is coming or not. And I feel, you know, if, if you are genuinely uh, sharing those, uh, business comes back. Uh, and again, uh, these times are challenging for everyone. Are you fun? You know, you don't make it very, very serious things. Uh, you need to be very, very positive. Uh, you don't need to uh, share a very, very pale picture that, you know, all is lost. You know, we are struggling here and there. Uh, how can you be still fun? Uh, during these times and you know stay positive and uh, 
it's it's challenging for the whole ecosystem such times internally how you are motivating your employees how you are staying fun with them you know it's it's a challenge for everyone salaries are cut a lot of things happen but uh, are you telling them that you know okay we have seen the such crisis in the past uh, and we are taking enough measures we should see a corrective measure in the next 6 months and how you are delivering the same again becomes very important they need not to hear like there is not only one channel where you are telling them you can again like lot of webinars were organized you can make them hear the same through very very different people influencers media uh in my lot of stakeholders and which gives a lot of assurance to them that things will be fine and again like we all know that uh there is upside there is a downside but uh it's very important during these times that the brand stay cool cool stay fun uh take everyone along with them so yeah so like these are some of the things which are very very important and i'm sharing a very interesting case study of uh, and i was speaking to a lot of people on what did they do right or what did they do wrong what were their challenges uh, so i'm sharing a case study of stag international one of the uh, big manufacturers in uh, sporting equipment so i was talking to them that you know uh, when this pandemic hit you last year uh, what did you do you know what were your initial impressions uh, so they they said you know these were the particular challenges uh, for them obviously the production came to a halt for some time uh, there was uncertainty around the demand from the us or you know how would the supply chain happen there were logistical challenges that was for everyone and uh, i was trying to understand you know how did you keep in touch how did you engage with your clients how did you engage with your uh, uh with your workers so basically you know a uh, couple of things which i found out in the conversation which i really liked what they did right were these you know uh, they said you know uh, irrespective of whatever happened it was a tough time for everyone what we realized was you know what has always worked for us is keep jumping onto opportunities a uh, crisis or not uh, that's very very important and when they when what what when they said you know keep jumping means you know uh, again uh, business people have that kind of understanding instinct where you know that okay you know where you need to jump uh, but at the same time your whole outlook is very very important to everything and when when you have seen a lot of things you know up, up, running a startup is not easy uh there are daily challenges so your whole outlook is very very important in such times so he said that you know uh what we did was we keep keep looking at opportunities even if they were smaller for us uh, it was always the case that we were not looking at bigger contracts but uh we we ensured that those jumps didn't become very very uh, uh these jumps were not calculated these jumps were all the time so that everyone around us stayed motivated during that time uh for them again like they said what did we do in terms of marketing per se for us he said we we communicated a lot we communicated very very proactively on all fronts it was very very important to keep your stakeholders engaged everyone and it was for us they said you know the first thing was if i think about the fact that uh, the business will not come right do i need to get rid of these employees uh, such such challenging situations come right uh, do i need to cut down on labor what do i need to do right now so such during such times he said you know what was very very important for us was we were constantly telling them what was happening with us at the same time we were telling them we are having conversations there is a chance there is a contract likely to come this is how we are going to do it uh, similarly we were telling the stakeholders uh the clients of ours on the us side that uh you know this is what the challenges are we are ready our employees are motivated if you think there is demand we will be quickly able to turn it around so there was this constant communication which was going up now this doesn't need a uh, a lot of uh spends what i mean this only what it needs is you know very very focused communication you need to know what your priorities are but again channels a marketing specialist so you know the channels a marketing specialist can just help it help you with the that added uh, 
person who can actually help you in quickly being very very agile to using those channels of communication to communicate effectively and uh, for them you know it was all about ensuring that that communication was happening 360 degrees and uh, they said that you know we we in march only we started planning about how will august be we were so confident that we will be able to turn it around uh, we knew that it was it was a question of one order and also they said that you know we we started like see obviously you know you need to be you need to know what is happening on the geopolitical front and i think what worked in their favor was also this whole uh, geopolitical dynamics where somewhere uh, china was being seen in a negative light uh, because of the corona virus situation so they were they were very very quick in terms of ensuring that they were able to uh, jump onto those opportunities where they were trying to shift to another country for their demands uh, similarly you know that they, they worked on production efficiency through automation and i'm talking about these business uh, changes which they did which i feel again are very very again important to even your marketing communication because all these little things need to be communicated all little little things which we might not think can become marketing communication uh, are very very important when you are trying to communicate 360 degrees so for them it was a great story you know in terms of uh, how 2020 panned out who could have thought you know they would grow 300% they said we didn't think frankly speaking but actually you know it was a great opportunity for us which we could tap just because of the fact that during all this time we were very very quick and agile in our communication and we were telling constantly what is happening and we were choosing the right channels uh, we were keeping our staff motivated we were doing a lot of these sessions for employees obviously we were using also our uh, media very very effectively uh, during these times uh, to to stay positive tell them positive stories that this is not the first time this thing is happening so all these things really really help uh, so i'll just uh, end here in terms of uh, my presentation i think most of the stuff anuj covered but i think uh, what is very very important is uh, i think any market one you are able to do a very very focused communication know your clients quality is very very important uh, be agile uh, you know have and again like if you are a small exporter uh, you know it's really it's very very difficult to do all the things uh, you know get a in house person in house specialist invest in him invest in content a lot of times we don't do that and when especially difficult situations come it becomes very very challenging so invest in a good content resource or invest in a good team uh, it it really really helps you to build a great brand uh, one which can be trusted one which can be you know which is seen as credible uh, these ethos uh, you know can be communicated very very effectively if you are uh, using services of a specialist so yeah like thank you thank you so much thank you so much for the wonderful wonderful presentation i would love to like to invite our next guest speaker he's here all the way from delhi despite the time difference dave has been kind enough to make this effort especially for the city cmsme members Dear members, join me to welcome Mr. Dave Medeiros. Dave is the director of design and marketing at Medeiros Design. He is deeply passionate about design, with marketing and branding being his forte. He has been designing and marketing and launching products in the USA, sourcing from different countries for over twenty years now. He works with tremendous knowledge and experience about consumer mindset and intelligently applies it to his business. The key features of this presentation today are how the US market has evolved over the last 30 years. Dave, I'd like you to share your presentation, and uh, you need to unmute yourself, Dave. Thank you, Tanya. Okay, let's see. Um, can everyone see that? 
uh, you have to share your presentation through the share content. Okay. Uh, okay. your presentation now. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, fantastic. Great. Okay, file defense. Okay, so I wanted to begin by discussing the changing landscape of retail. Um, things have changed quite a lot over the last um, 20 years in the United States. And I'm going to go over a very brief history of how that began. Um, the retail model in the United States has always been based around the department store. The department store in the United States is a one-stop shopping experience where every single category was available to the consumer. This began with uh, industry leaders like Macy's and Sears. And that, that, that be, made the model that all of retail was built on. Macy's was started in 1858 and became the very first department store in the United States. And through that time, it built its first store in Herald Square in New York City in 1878. It basically, in that first year, made about $85,000. And by the late 1920s, Macy's was the biggest department store in the USA. It expanded in the 80s and the 90s. And the Federated Corporation bought Macy's and merged it with Bloomingdale's, Mays, Marshall Fields, Lord and & Taylor, and the Hatch Chain. And that deal itself cost Federated $11 billion. Around that same time, um, you, the Sears... Dave, excuse me, can you enlarge your presentation so that members, everybody can see it more clearly? Maybe just okay, sorry about that. Let me see oh, how... Okay. No I think that's the present button. I think that's good. If you know you need to uh, do the full screen, but if you can't find it, then I think we're good to go. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I think there's no I'm missing something. No problem. Present. Okay, so um, Macy's, as you can see, um, uh, sorry, Sears started out as a mail order catalog in 1892, and they opened up their first store in 1925, and Kmart bought Sears um, for $11.5 billion. This, these two activities basically brought together and consolidated all of the independent department stores and created two large corporations, one owned by Kmart and one owned by Federated, 
to really consolidate all of the department stores really under two major brands. In 1983, Sears hit a peak at, and their sales soared. The value of Sears in 2007 was $193 a share in 2007. Macy's was, sales were, income was reported at $699 billion, million, compared to $440 million the year before they consolidated. The all-time high for Macy's stock was 7280 in 2015. You're probably asking me, thinking, why is he telling us all of this about the department stores? Well, the reason is all of retail was designed around department stores. All of these major brands were hubs in a mall. This is how an American mall is organized you'll see that the whole mall is anchored around major department stores, these hubs. And all of this other area was contained with smaller specialty stores. So this gave rise, department stores gave rise to what is called the anchor store. And that is the department store. The first malls were designed um, in, by a artist called Victor Gruen in fifth, 1954. And then two years later, in 1956, that expansion of malls began. This graph here shows you how much malls were built up from 1970 through 2017. As you can see, the growth is absolutely unprecedented. An amazing amount of malls were built throughout the whole country. But in some odd way, the mall itself actually killed the department store. Why is that? Well, department stores started to use the, lose their lusters because discounters were copying their model and selling, giving customers the same huge selection of product, but they were doing it at much lower prices. That also combined with various recessions caused a massive discounting of product and these large department stores found themselves having to discount, 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 narrowing their margin. In addition to that, the mall was surrounded by specialty stores. And these specialty stores, they would basically offer assortments that were much larger, say like clothing, instead of having the 10 or 15 styles of jackets that a department store could carry. There could be one store that was just focused on coats and they would have a much larger selection. So the mall was being surrounded by smaller specialty stores who were eating into their market, offering better selections. So the department store began to lose its luster with the American consumer. This is a graph showing Macy's and their decline. And as you can see, in the year 2006, they hit their high and have not been able to regain the kind of sales that they once had. Here's an example of Macy's LinkedIn profiles. And you can see that their employee count has dramatically dropped to an all-time low. Here's a graph of Sears showing their decline. And as you can see, in 2008 through 2018, their glory years were in 2011 
and dramatically dropped every year since then. So, who killed them all? Well, it's kind of complicated, but specialty stores, massive amounts of debt, the, the death of department store, overbuilding, demographic decline. We have Generation Y, which is not as large as baby boomers. So we had a lot of malls and a lot less customers. Suburban sprawl. Um, people started to move further and further into the suburbs outside of the cities and further away from the malls. Discount retailers like, came, uh, like Walmart, a ro Target, eroded the department store. Um, E-commerce is a massive, massive issue. Amazon and COVID. So basically what we are seeing in the United States is a collapse of malls. 25% of American malls will close in the next five years. So that means we'll be left with weak malls, malls that are called B, C, and D rated malls. These malls, um, they produce less per square foot. And those malls are even, even more danger of collapsing. There are roughly 380 C and D rated malls, and many of them are expected to close. More retailers are shutting their mall stores, and this year, over 950 stores have closed inside these malls, and it really has gone unnoticed in the press, and these malls are in critical condition, and they cannot really sustain their rent. Even high-end malls in very affluent areas are under pressure and are at risk of closing. So this has really created somewhat of a retail Armageddon in the United States. And we are looking at a lot of store closures. We expect 8,741 stores to shutter in the US. US apparel stores have suffered the most with 3,151 closures. Analysts predict to see a 14% increase in closures this year, perhaps bringing closures up to 10,000 stores. Retailers are shrinking their physical presence. They're closing down all of those stores that are in those weaker malls. They're using COVID as a uh, bargaining chip to reduce their rents. And um, many of them are just choosing to close those stores in those low performing malls and shrinking their platform. And basically many of your major retailers are trying to channel more of their energy and sales and investments towards online sales. So many of these retailers are now achieving 35% more of their sales online. And that I think is important because it's, it's going to affect how they buy from, custom, from vendors. Many of these vendors of customers are going to want to be coming to folks like you and say, we need smaller quantities of these items because we want to sell them online. And it's important that you understand the environment that a retailer is operating in and help them navigate their way through this. They're working in an omni-channel environment where they'll be wanting to buy, say, 60% of their product mix and put it in the store, but the other 40% might be targeted toward the web, and they'll be looking for their suppliers to support them in that area and give them 
smaller MOQs for these uh, web purchases. And understand that the web is also being used as a learning place, a place where they can test market what is good and transfer it into the store. So you, it's important to look at those smaller MOQ orders as an opportunity to grow your sales in the retail channels that the, um, that the retailer has. These are the 2020 closings for this year. And as you can see, they, these are a lot of the stores that are closed. And you'll notice that m many of you, maybe these are some of your customers, but you'll see in the middle here, Macy's is going to be closing 125 stores over the next three years. Many of these stores, Chico's will be closing 100 stores. Um, the Gap will be closing 350 stores. So we are in the middle of a flux here. We are, we're going to be changing. With, um, there's going to be consolidation. There's going to be more movement from brick and mortar to the web. Bankruptcies. There has been a lot of bankruptcies this year, unprecedented bankruptcies. Why another reason that this has happened is private equity. A lot of these retailers have depended on private equity and these private equity firms basically load a lot of debt onto the retailer and they want to draw down as much of their, of their investment back and pay this debt back, which oftentimes leaves these companies anemic with very little resources to grow. And private equity has had a big role in killing retail. So what's the third part? E-commerce. E-commerce has been a huge impactor on retail. And those who have not been able to adapt have not grown. This chart here will show you exactly how much the share and proportion of an average retailer has gone from brick and mortar to web. And as you can see, in just three short years, the massive growth of US e-commerce versus the total retail sales. Here we've got e-commerce penetration. And as you can see, from 2007, only 5% of e-commerce in the United, was e-commerce in the United States versus 2020, where 21.3% of all retail sales are now e-commerce sales. This chart here is going to show you how e-commerce versus brick and mortar has changed over the years. And what you can see here is the massive increase from 2019, while brick and mortar sales have remained flat. So this brings us to Amazon. Amazon has probably been the absolute biggest impactor of the average retailer's sales. And this chart here will show, illustrate to everybody the difference between Amazon's Prime Day sale versus Macy's. So if any of you don't know this, there's a thing called Amazon Prime, which is a membership service that you can sign up for and a consumer will pay a hundred dollar prescription subscription to prime and they will be able to get all of their packages shipped free 
this has really changed the um, whole landscape of retail in the United States. Amazon has something called Prime Day, which is basically offers big sales for just one day. And this chart here will show you how Amazon Prime Day generated $7.2 billion in just one day. This chart compares it to the total sales of, other, of major retailers. So if we take a look at this, Amazon Prime made more money in one day than the Dillard store made all year. It basically is 10, in one day, Amazon made 10 times more uh, than many of these other retailers. Look at Macy's, 24.9 billion. That's all year, folks. That's how much Macy's made in one year compared to Amazon Prime in just one day. So clearly, Amazon is the 900 pound gorilla that every retailer is trying to fight. But it's also an opportunity for all of you because this marketplace is open to you. You can create your own store on Amazon and you can sell direct to consumers on Amazon. And you will be given entree to this massive, massive market. Here you can see Amazon's annual revenue in billions of dollars. And in, since 2009, the unprecedented growth that you see here. Amazon's revenue has climbed over a thousand percent in the past decade. Here is an example of where Amazon stands in relationship to any other major e-com company. And as you can see, they're 10 times larger than Walmart. And Walmart is the biggest retailer in the United States. So Amazon is essentially a monopoly for e-com in the United States. They own 47% of the total share of e-commerce in the United States. So this is an amazing statistic. This chart here shows how people search for products in the United States. So 54% of every single product search is started on Amazon. And <clears throat> As you can see, when Amazon started back in, in 2015, the growth rate has inverted. The majority of searches used to start in Google. Now the majority of searches start on Amazon. We expect this to only increase. Here is an, a chart that shows the opportunity for all of you, which is third party sellers. As you can see here in 1999, when Amazon only 3% of the goods that were available on Amazon were from third party sellers. Whereas now in 2018, 58% of all Amazon sales were third-party sellers. So we can expect this to just grow and grow and grow. This represents about 52% compounded growth since 1999, and $22.9 billion of Amazon's revenue comes from third-party sellers. So I think a lot of you folks would be wise to think about how you can sell your product to third, uh, as a third party seller on Amazon. And if not that,
be very open-minded to selling to people who are Amazon third-party people and getting your product into those hands, making connections with those third-party sellers because this is the engine that drives Amazon. And Amazon is not going away and COVID has only accelerated this buying process. So COVID has closed many brick and mortar stores and it is pushing people onto the web. The whole business model of the mall, which is about pulling you in so you can get there longer and shop has just completely unraveled. And the process, the, the other things that you typically might find in a mall and reasons to go there, like restaurants and movies and entertainment, well, all of those facilities are closed. So the malls have really become ghost towns. And all of the changes that were happening in retail, COVID has just accelerated all of those processes. And people are shopping online far more than they ever have. And retailers are having to respond and they are doing things like order online, pick up at the store, order online, they'll deliver to your car when you pick up, or, it, or just basically pushing larger majorities of their sales to e-commerce. So who are the leading retailers in the United States now? Well, this chart's going to show you that the largest brick and mortar are Walmart, basically then followed by Amazon, Costco. And then after that, you basically have drug stores and you have grocery stores. What you'll notice is there's no department store in this list. Walmart is a discounter. They're the biggest, they're the biggest retailer, but Behind that is Amazon, and behind that is just Costco, another discounter, and behind that are basically building supply stores and pharmacies. So who are the leading e-commerce companies? Amazon, Walmart, eBay, Wayfair. Um, and then you have uh, Best Buy, Target, Costco, and our department store way at the bottom, Macy's. So you can see that the death of the department store has really devastated the mall. And then the mall being devastated means all of those specialty stores that surrounded those anchor stores and department stores, they have been affected too. And the people who are survived the best have been your large discounters, and anybody who is, was smart enough to build a robust e-commerce platform. So throughout this, you're probably asking, well, that's a lot of change, Dave. What hasn't changed? Well, the thing that hasn't changed are the holidays and the events that drive sales. Christmas is by far the biggest market that the United States have. It drives for most people, um, some retailers might bank 80% of all of their revenue for Christmas. So you might, I want to take it, look, show you this chart here. And this chart will show you that Christmas grows year over year. So what are some of the things that we should think about. Well, we should probably look at what has been working. Um, online sales for non-sales items total year were 209 billion. That was a year-over-year -year increase for that holiday of 23.9%. 
Sales at building material and garden supply stores have seen some of the largest, largest growth, 19% in 2019. And sporting goods sales were up 15%. And electronic sales and clothing, that has saw, saw big decreases. And e-commerce continues to see a massive gain of 47.2% over the last holiday season. Will that hold up when COVID is gone? I'm not sure, but I'm gonna say yes, that it probably will be at least very close to that 47.2%. So Christmas is huge, and we saw a 15% increase over the last year. And Adobe Analytics examined 80% of their online transactions and at, the, and at the largest U.S. online retailers and found the largest online share was on Cyber Monday. Remember, when you're thinking about Christmas, Christmas is not just um, a one-time event. There are other events like Thanksgiving Day, Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, and Cyber Monday. These are big events that are all rolled up into the Christmas holiday, and they drive massive amounts of sales. You can see by this chart here how they have, are huge, and you can see that they increase every year. The next major holiday that everyone should consider, and when you're thinking about your product mixes, is Mother's Day. Mother's Day is huge and it keeps growing every year. As you can see by this chart from 2007 to 2020, we've gone from $15.7 billion to $26.7 billion. So you might want to be thinking about your product mixes and how you can target this holiday and provide product for your customers that is basically focusing on this holiday. Another big holiday is Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day um, continues to grow and there are the, the, the average consumer might spend $196 on a gift. Um, jewelry is by far the, the biggest driver of, of uh, those sales. So those folks of you, those suppliers out there who are doing jewelry, I'm sure you know about that, but um, you definitely want to consider Valentine's Day. I don't think it is as big as Mother's Day, but um, it is a very big holiday. Father's Day is also another big holiday in the United States, and you might want to consider putting some products together that meet, target this audience. Um, you, the average consumer will probably pay $149, $139 on Father's Day. We saw a little bit of decrease on th this, but it's basically still growing every year. Halloween is also a major holiday in the United States. And this is driven greatly by um, costumes, but there's a lot of money being sold on things related to parties, um, decorations, and there's, this is another big opportunity. You can look, oh, sorry, wrong slide. Um, you, can, you can look to see this holiday grow. I think last year, uh, um, this year, obviously COVID had a big impact on that, but I, after COVID, I think you can expect a big rebound in this area. Back to school is another major, major uh, area of, of consumer spending. And you might wanna consider creating some products 
that meet this need. When you're thinking about this product, there, it breaks down into two parts. One is college and one is elementary school. So college is the larger portion of this market with about 80, uh, $80.7 billion being spent in total. About 54.5 is college only. So these are products that um, might be furniture, um, it might be decorations, things that um, the young student is going to need to live on campus. This year, COVID has closed all the colleges. And so many people who have left for school have had to return and work from home. And many retailers are trying to adjust to this. And we're all wondering, will this be an ongoing thing? Will education as uh, being remote continue? And are there products that we should consider that will easily move from home to office, from college to home, from elementary school to home? So these might spark some ideas on how you can create some innovative products that work in this manner. So what will the future of retail look like? It's going to be different. It, and there's no way that we can stop this change. Retailers are going to have to do things to make things frictionless with their customer. They're going to have to make sure that they're providing a unique experience in order to get those customers to leave their homes and not sell on e-com. So specialty stores are going to have to improve their product relevance. They're going to have to have more products. They're going to have to swap them in and out much faster. Um, retailers have to make a seamless experience online and offline. So products that are sold in the store um, are going to have to be able to be purchased online and picked up. We're probably going to see in the future micro fulfillment centers where Amazon will, is going to build warehouses where you can get your product sent to you in three hours or four hours instead of 24 hours. Um, we're going to see retailers wanting to do very curated inventories um, coming in and out of them faster. They're going to be wanting things that are far more unique that can't be found on Amazon. Brick and mortar stores are going to adopt elements of online experiences. So when they walk into the store, um, they um, might have uh, iPads there so they can search where to find things. Um, you're going to find um, cashierless stores, stores where there are no cashier and they're self-service. Um, pick up and pay options where you buy online and you go to a storage unit uh, where you uh, punch in a code and inside there your product is sitting so you make no contact with a retail person at all. These empty malls are going to create problems and opportunities for mall owners. And they're probably going to be offering um, pop-up stores free rent just to create enthusiasm and excitement to come into the mall and offer um, their new brand for say a week or two weeks. Um, you're going to see a lot more retailers wanting to collaborate with e-commerce brands and use 
their brands to elevate and drive product into their stores. This is already happening. It used to be different where back in the day, you had to get yourself into a major store and then that would drive your whole wholesale business. If you could get into a, a Bergdorf Goodman or a Neiman Marcus, then that would give you entree and build your brand. But now these department stores are going online and they're looking for exciting e-commerce brands who have followers and they're, they, they have people who influence, influencers who are talking about them and they're going and searching for these brands to put into their stores. So that's something to think about in terms of your own brand and developing your own brand because this is something that you can leverage and use to help you get your brand into a store. You're going to probably see voice recognition where people will go into, their, into a store and they'll use their telephone and the telephone will guide them to exactly where the product is in the store. We're going to see self-driving vehicles that have product loaded on them. So instead of having to run out into the, in the middle of the night to get diapers for your baby, you can just use your smartphone and an autonomous vehicle can drive up to your house. You put your credit card into the machine, uh, into the vehicle, and it will shoot out some diapers on the uh, outside of the uh, vehicle itself. Shoppable TV is something that is we'll be seeing in the future where you'll be watching a television show and you'll be able to press a button and everything that's on that show will be available for purchase and you can click on it and stick it in your car while you're watching the show. Another thing that will probably be happening is retailers will be mining the data on customers and your smartphone will indicate who you are. So when you walk into the store, retailers will know what you, what you like, things that you've purchased in before, what your first name is. So that will give the salesperson the ability to enhance that sale and make some suggestions that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do without that data. So what do you need to do to do business with a retailer and what do they want to know? So I put together some questions that you might get from a retailer and I'm going to provide some background of why they're asking that question. So what are your current sales? Well, when a, when a retailer asks this, what they're trying to figure out is your ability to fulfill their needs. Are you ready for a big order? So you should really have those answers prepared. You don't want to be caught flat-footed. What do you call, who do you currently sell to? Well, when a retailer is asking this, very much in the same way as question, the first question, they're trying to figure out if you're prepared. But they're also trying to figure out whether your product aligns with their product. Are you selling to someone who's a competitor? And maybe what do you have that might be similar? So that'll be the next question when you get that. What do you sell to them? They want to know that because they want to know what works. If it works for vendor, for, for retailer A, then it's probably going to work for them. Do you have, how are you marketing your product? So when they're asking this, they're probably trying to figure out if you have traction. Is there anything that they can build on? Are there any tailwinds? Do you have a uh, presence online? Do you have influencers that are pushing your product? Are you running Facebook ad campaigns? 
Are there a way that you can do some cross marketing so that they can grab a tailwind off of what you're currently doing? Do you have domestic stock available to ship? Well, this question is being asked because they want to know how fast they can get to market. Because a lot of retailers are having to fulfill their brick and mortar stores and their e-com stores, they're very different channels. The uh, e-commerce channel requires smaller quantities and you need to come to market faster. So there is an advantage working with a vendor who might have product sitting in a warehouse so that they can draw down from that and replenish their e-com site with smaller quantities, but more frequently. What's your MOQ? So this is a question that is very important because they're trying to figure out how flexible you are. And so I would always ask everyone to remain flexible in this area because you can eliminate a lot of opportunities by being too aggressive in this area. Can you handle my business? Well, this question is really kind of a buy signal because they're basically interested if you're getting to that point. But what they're asking for is for you to give them assurance. They're already feeling comfortable, but they need assurance to know that you're going to be there. So you might want to think about how to provide stories on how you have accomplished fulfilling orders with other people, um, telling them about your logistics, telling them about your quality control, giving them the assurances that they need to do business with you. How is your product gonna grow my category? This is not a buy signal. <laughs> This is, this is a signal that they really don't think that your product matches up and they're looking for a good argument. So you need to be prepared to A, convince them and make sure you have a very good convincing argument or you need to pivot and change what product that you're selling to them and might work for them. How can you meet my margin? Well, you know, I'm sure you've all heard this question, but what I would say to everyone here is don't get hooked on, on margin. Realize that when you have an opportunity, you, you, you are better off taking a short margin on an item to open up the door than to be very rigid and require uh, a set margin for every sale. So I'm going to leave everybody with three questions that you should always use. 95% of all salespeople and marketing people will never ask these questions, but these questions will give you a huge edge with a customer. One of them is, what does your ideal partnership look like? Well, you know, why ask this question, you might ask? Well, it's about storytelling. If you can get your customer to explain to you what an ideal partnership looks like, then that reveals to you where their value system is. You might be thinking that this particular customer is coming to you for your design, but what they might reveal in that conversation is what they really value is margin. And instead of focusing on design with that customer, you can then focus on the values and the things that are really important to them.
this is will separate you from a lot of other people it really will because it will it will help create a roadmap for you to figure out exactly who the perfect date is for your customer it's like matchmaking and finding the best husband or wife what is your ideal husband or wife if, if someone asks you that on that first date you probably will learn a whole lot about that person once they answer that question and much like a retailer it is the same question and you can create a whole model around that and figure out how you're going to tailor things to them what do you think about my product and how can i improve it so this is a two-part question ask the first part because they might love your product and you don't need to be asked how to improve it but ask that question ask for critique because if you don't ask you're not going to know and customers will be perfectly willing to share this information with you and you can use this to tailor your product they might tell you your product is not what i'm looking for and but you can but by finding out what's wrong with your product you can go back and make a present redesign the product and then represent it they'll a, a, a retailer would be delighted to have that experience to 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 walk into a booth and meet somebody and see a product that does not fit their needs and be given this question and then get an email a month later with the exact product that they wanted that will be a contrasting experience that they will have that will separate you from 99% of other suppliers. The next question that I would ask is, what are your merchandising goals for the next few years? Well, the reason that we're asking this question is we're trying to find out what is the corporate goals for this country. Even buyers lose sight of this, but trust me, they will have to find their way back to it every time they lose sight because their supervisors will be reminding them, well, you know, you did a great job putting this assortment, but our goal this year was to increase our margin by 15%. You lost sight of that goal and you need to refocus on that goal. So by asking this question, you'll be gaining insight to the long-term vision of what that retailer is looking for. And you can keep that in your, in your mind when you're doing your presentation. Retailer A told me that they're trying to increase margin. So even though the buyer didn't remind me of that every conversation that I have, I need to keep that in the forefront of my mind and I need to maybe shave a couple of points off my prices here so that I am helping the buyer reach their goals. Remember, buyers have bosses and if you make them look great to their boss, then they're going to be successful and they're going to come back to you. Remember, you're trying to build a partnership with these customers not just be a vendor so try to add value every time you work with somebody not every experience with a customer is going to pay a dividend but if you can provide value to a customer if you can shape that relationship into a partnership rather than buy something from me, I fulfill your order, bye-bye. That is not a long-term strategy to build a partnership. But by asking these questions, you'll have a roadmap to what the goals, the values, and how your products fit, and the kind of products 
that that customer wants. And you can go back armed with that information to change your product mix, change your strategy, and refocus. And this is a very winning strategy to build that partnership. I want to thank everybody for uh, inviting me and, 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 and uh, sharing with my presentation here. Sorry I couldn't expand the screen bigger, but uh, I had a little technical difficulty. And thank you, Tanya, for inviting me. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. You know, um, we really appreciate you uh, joining us, uh, even despite the time difference, and sharing those real in-depth insights of how the focus from the detail has shifted towards the e-commerce, uh, giving member, uh, members some useful tips on how to get uh, the maximum out of the detail business and how it's uh, changing parts and um, yeah thank you very much Dave. thank you so much we have one question from our members here and they would like to know um, from any of the panelists any of the speakers who would like to address this um, how can one make b2b connection on social media what are the means and ways to do so Would you like to take that up? Yeah, sure. I would. Uh, um, I would also add to it that B two B connections on social media. When we say social media, I think you are referring to platforms like uh, Instagram, Facebook, yeah. and LinkedIn, because this would be the medium of uh, connecting to the customers. So, as I said during my presentation, for B two B customers, one of the best platforms would be to connect on LinkedIn is to do a research on the LinkedIn sessions and to identify your target customer. Who is that customer that you would like to connect? Um, you have to do certain homework regarding connect, getting the right connection. And there is a whole science behind LinkedIn uh, connection and how do you build your profile. So I would recommend that um, there is a sequence of event that needs to be done by starting from building up your profile and first to uh, achieve your profile performance and that, then start connecting. So LinkedIn would be the preferred platform for B2B uh, when it comes to connecting on social media. Facebook and Instagram could be good for B2C, but from my experience, B2B is a preferred platform. LinkedIn would be the way to go forward. I hope this one solves it. Uh, what means and ways to do it is there are plenty of ways to do it and there is a whole science behind it. So it's a it's a pretty uh, long process. So, of course, build up your profile. Start uh, first. Start creating content which is of relevance to your customers. Uh, start establishing uh, who you are, what your company is, what do you do, how you can help your customer, and then start sending uh, connection requests. It's not only sending connection requests because people get bored of just getting requests. Even if you are not able to show how you're going to add value, nobody is going to be accepting your request. So it's not that uh, thing. They have to first be authentic about delivering value and uh, market your message very clearly and precisely. Thank you so much, Anuj. Thank you for this. Do we have any other questions? Uh, I So I would call it a day today. Thank you very much to all our panelists, all our speakers today uh, for sharing some very, very useful insights, uh, you know, leading our members to understanding what are the factors that are responsible for being able to launch their product in the US market, uh, marketing their product the right way and branding it. Um, I'm glad we talked a lot about content building also today, which is also now a very important part of marketing and branding. So, um, and launching your product, reaching out to customers uh, in the way that they, they would like to see an Indian supplier. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a very good weekend. Stay safe. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks a lot for being Thank a yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.
ദയവായി ഗുഡ് ഡോ